many countries around the world are easing their measures to curb the coronavirus pandemic, with more liberties and fewer restrictions again. Spain is one of them. And so is South Africa. Hopes are rising here that the pandemic will soon become endemic, promising an end to restrictions. So how might COVID-19 become endemic? And what would that mean? Our topic on this week's COVID-19 special. Welcome. Today is an important day for Sipelo Khalivane. Two years ago, financial problems and the pandemic forced him to close his bar and restaurant in Cape Town's Kailicha Township. But now he's finally reopening. COVID has taught us a lot of things that you need to put your eggs in different baskets. And also you need to try and think outside the box because I mean, for me, I don't cast the storm. From whatever bad situation that I'm in, I always look for positive things, better things that I can do instead of complaining. After nearly two years, most lockdown restrictions were lifted, including a nightly curfew. Tourists have once again been pouring into the country. There had been mass cancellations following the discovery of the Omicron variant. Life is slowly getting back to normal here in Cape Town with decreasing numbers in new COVID infections. Data from South Africa suggests although Omicron is much more infectious, the amount of people that were admitted to hospitals was much lower than during previous waves. Many here are hoping that we're seeing the beginning of the end of the pandemic. I so wish that uh, I won't even hear about the, the name COVID. That, that's what we're we are wishing for. It's very nice to see everyone just going out and about, relaxing, going outside. I mean, we've been locked, locked down in our houses for how long now? I hope that Omicron is actually the final <laughs> stage of this virus. To see such enjoyment, to see such happiness, I'm so happy that the business is booming. People can start making money. Our country is officially open. When last did I see such a such hecticness and business. I'm glad that we can get to come here and enjoy. Many scientists are also optimistic despite the low vaccination rate. Virologist Wolfgang Preiser says that many South Africans had already been infected with the coronavirus before the Omicron wave. Hospital data show that a prior coronavirus infection or vaccination provides protection against severe illness, also with the Omicron variant. When you arrive at a situation like the one we have here now, where nearly everyone has recovered from an infection or has been vaccinated, then you can relax. And of course, it's summer here. During much of the fourth wave here, our schools were on holiday. In Europe, the school holiday was much shorter. School is starting again. Companies that took an annual holiday are back at work too. And of course, it's winter, when people spend much more time together indoors. Those are major differences. That's why you can't just expect things in Europe to go exactly the way they have in South Africa. Preiser hopes that the pandemic could become endemic as with other coronaviruses if most of the population has a basic immunity from previous infection or vaccination. I still have hope that we'll be able to avoid the need for regular booster shots. Let's say that everyone is fully vaccinated and boosted and perhaps also gets an Omicron-specific booster during the coming year. And let's also say we don't suddenly find ourselves confronted with a nasty surprise in the form of another new variant. Then we might be able to maintain a decent level of immunity with regular reinfections. No one wants to think about more mutations right now in the milk restaurant and bar, certainly not owner Sipelo Khalivane. He already has big plans and wants to expand to other cities. He believes that the prospects for South Africa once again look good. And what about Germany and Europe? Here, the rate of new infections has hit record levels. Tens of thousands are catching COVID-19 and passing it on. We seem to be at its mercy and we're sick of it all. 
Here in the newsroom, talk revolves mainly around one question. Will life ever return to normal? Lockdowns, contact restrictions, schools opening, schools closing, and a series of new SARS-CoV-2 variants, each in some ways worse than the last. When will this pandemic end? When will the virus become endemic? And what does that even mean? That we can go back to our pre-pandemic ways? Nice thought, but it's still a pandemic out there. So let's take a look at where we are right now. In a pandemic, a disease spreads across national borders and continents. SARS-CoV-2 affects the entire world. All pandemics eventually end, but no one can say exactly when the current one will be over. The Spanish flu is an example of an influenza pandemic that's thought to have killed between 50 and 100 million people. It lasted around three years. The seventh cholera pandemic began in South Asia in 1961 and continues to this day. It leads up to 140,000 deaths annually. After two years of a non-stop COVID-19 pandemic with millions of people dead and billions more vaccinated, recovered or both, there's increasing talk of the coronavirus becoming endemic. What does that mean? In ancient Greek, endemos means among the people. So if SARS-CoV-2 is endemic, it's come to stay. However, endemic viruses are not equally present everywhere all the time. Although endemic viruses circulate non-stop within particular populations, the number of infections can fluctuate, based, for example, on the seasons. Other cold viruses demonstrate this. Wintertime is cold season. This will not change next winter or the winter after that. It's predictable. Malaria is an example of an endemic infectious disease that's a major problem, particularly in certain African regions. And malaria is also a good example of a popular misconception that an endemic pathogen is automatically a less dangerous pathogen. It isn't. According to the World Health Organization, malaria killed 627,000 people in 2020 alone. On the other hand, there are several endemic coronaviruses that usually only cause fairly harmless cold-like symptoms. So what will happen with SARS-CoV-2? The Omicron variant of the virus has many people hoping that in the future the majority of COVID infections will be mild. However, we don't know what variant might be just around the corner. What is clear, though, is that we'll have to continue to live with SARS-CoV-2 in the future. Nonetheless, some European countries, including Denmark, Spain and the UK, have already decided to roll back antivirus measures. Most are aware that it's something of an experiment, along the lines of, let's see what happens. We take a look at what's happening in the Spanish capital, Madrid. Here in Madrid, cafes are full to the brim with people enjoying the afternoon sun. No one seems to be worried that a guest at the next table could have COVID. A number of coronavirus restrictions have already been rolled back here. We have to free ourselves of this fear. You can't live in constant fear. The virus has become quite a bit less dangerous recently. We're learning to live with the virus, just as we have with the flu and with other viruses. This relaxed mood is partly due to the success of Spain's vaccination program. More than 80% of the population has received at least two jabs, and hospitalization rates are also on the decline. That's also why the Spanish government has announced it's planning to lift a series of other restrictions. That includes ramping down coronavirus testing and easing quarantine rules. A flu instead of a deadly pandemic. This is how Prime Minister Sanchez wants to treat the coronavirus in the future. And he sees himself as a pioneer in Europe. 
But there are also critics that say that it's too early for such experiments. They point out that many Spanish clinics continue to work at their limit. One of Spain's leading coronavirus experts, Isabel Sola, is also urging caution. She's a researcher at Spain's National Center of Biotechnology. We must stay prepared for surprises. The way the virus will develop is something we can't predict. The virus wants to keep spreading. So that might mean that infections will become less severe over time, but the exact opposite could also be true. For the moment, many in Spain seem to welcome the easing of restrictions. Almost two years into the pandemic, they're ready to believe that the danger has passed. Many experts in Germany are also urging caution. DW reporter Stephanie Zobel spoke with Professor Hayo Zaip. The Bremen-based epidemiologist has earned the reputation of being a voice of calm in the pandemic storm. Professor Hayot Seip, thanks for talking to us. Many hope that COVID-19 will become endemic and all of the suffering under the pandemic will end. Would that be the case? Endemic doesn't mean that it's entirely over or that it's no longer a threat. Depending on virus mutations, the situation could change and COVID could become an epidemic again and spread at a higher rate again. Even if this doesn't happen, even if the infection rates don't suddenly surge, an endemic disease still means people will still be getting infected and getting sick. We'll have to take appropriate measures to deal with that and make sure that our hospitals can cope. So our precautions, our public health and hygiene measures will still be a part of everyday life in an endemic scenario. Is an endemic SARS virus less dangerous? You could say it might be less dangerous, yes, but that would take two things. First, the biological severity would have to be lower, meaning there would be fewer serious cases and lower mortality rates. You'd see that change over time through biological evolution. And second, our response to the virus is also a factor. That includes the immunity we achieve through effective vaccination campaigns, as well as the immunity achieved through infection. And third, there are also various countermeasures, like social distancing, wearing masks and so on. All of those would help level out the infection rates. Can we help the pandemic become an endemic scenario? Yes, we can, of course. First of all, by building up our immunity, especially by way of high vaccination rates and high rates everywhere. That's how we might be able to achieve this endemic state, by making sure that our immunity is robust enough to prevent sudden epidemic outbreaks. Vaccination is key. Is it possible to maintain an endemic state in a globalized world? That's a good question. One of the big preconditions for that would be eliminating these huge drastic disparities in immunization rates around the world. That's why the World Health Organization, for example, is constantly emphasizing that we need vaccine equity, high vaccination rates in all countries. Distributing vaccines as evenly as possible will help us achieve this endemic state. When a few countries have extremely high vaccination rates, but other countries have very low rates, that's where the conditions are ripe for the virus to continue to spread and mutate. That's what helps create problems, which in a global context could lead to a resurgence of the epidemic over and over, which would sweep around the world. What other scenarios are there? There are several alternative scenarios. One would be to actually defeat, to eliminate the coronavirus. Take China, for example, which is sticking to its zero COVID policy. They're pursuing a policy of keeping COVID out of their country, in the short term and especially in the long term. 
It's easy to see why that's not a particularly pragmatic approach. They would have to steer clear of all sorts of global activities or build very high walls to keep the virus out. That strikes me as very difficult, as an illusion. In human history, there are only a few viruses we've managed to eradicate. We did it with smallpox, with a global vaccination program, but that's one of the rare exceptions. Professor Hayotse, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, too. Now to DW Science Editor Derek Williams, who's been following developments and answering your questions since the onset of the pandemic. This week, YouTube user Juan Pedro Sierro asked, Why did the Spanish flu pandemic end, even though they never developed treatments or a vaccine? In 1918, just as humanity began to, to stagger towards the end of what, at that point, was the most destructive conflict in human history, a new flu virus appeared that would later be called the Spanish flu. Now, that name was inaccurate since the disease didn't show up in Spain first. It was only the first place that newspapers began to report on it. Um, the virus that caused the new flu was a subtype called H1N1. And it's thought that during the pandemic that rolled over the world in the following couple of years around one in three people were infected by the pathogen. Um, we don't have records good enough to make exact calculations of the destruction that it caused, but, but most estimates say the virus claimed between 50 and 100 million victims. Um, that would have been around one in 25 people on the planet at the time. Then, three years into the pandemic, the Spanish flu seemed to fade away. Uh, without any clear explanation, it just sort of trailed off. Uh, no one at the time really knew why. Now, experts postulate that it was because without vaccines, that's how long it took to acquire a measure of global herd protection through infection, uh, when enough people grew immune enough to the pathogen to stop spreading it to others, transmission sputtered and died. Or did it, really? Um, that's a really interesting aspect of the narrative, experts say, because even though mass death due to the pandemic ended in the early 1920s, the virus that caused it didn't just disappear, instead, um, they think the immunity developed by large swaths of the population drove the pathogen to mutate, and it mutated into less deadly forms. Um, in fact, researchers who analyze genomes in flu viruses that circulate today have identified genetic similarities that link them to the H1N1 virus that first appeared in 1918. Um, that original virus has been sequenced from, from lung samples taken from people who died from the virus back then. In that sense, the Spanish flu virus is, is still with us today. It's just evolved to be less virulent, but it also occasionally then evolves further and can throw out uh, deadlier variants and, and strains, though at least so far, uh, never any as, as deadly as its distant ancestor. And now for some animals with superpowers, such as sharks, camels, and their cousins in South America, alpacas. Scientists have found neutralizing antibodies to the coronavirus and its variants in these species. Could animals help bring an end to the pandemic that probably began in an animal? At first glance, this South American alpaca looks like an ordinary animal. But scientists think it could help us fight the coronavirus pandemic. 
A herd of 19 alpacas are living on the campus of Austral University in Valdivia, southern Chile. Biochemist Alejandro Rojas is conducting research working with the alpacas. This male alpaca is called Buddha. He's developed neutralizing antibodies against a number of COVID-19 variants, including Omicron. The scientists first vaccinated the alpaca with surface proteins from the COVID-19 virus. Then they took a blood sample and found nanobodies that can neutralize SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Nanobodies are much smaller than normal antibodies. Their structure is also less complex and they're quite easy to reproduce, using yeast cultures, for example. Nanobodies are only produced by camelids, so alpacas, llamas, camels and dromedaries, and by sharks. Even before the pandemic began, Rojas and his team founded and publicized an initiative aimed at combating emerging viruses. But they didn't have any animals to work with until an unexpected visitor turned up. In 2019, a Buddhist monk who wants to help us came to visit. He gave us four alpacas. One of them was Buddha. Then we have Dilgo, Tara and Pedro. They haven't just produced antibodies to fight SARS-CoV-2 like Buddha, but against other viruses too, like Nipah virus and Hendra virus. Pedro here, for example. The research doesn't harm the alpacas. Once a year, they're vaccinated by vets who then take a small sample of blood. The animals are cared for by veterinarian Teresa Pinto. They're like pets. They eat out of our hands. We take care of them and love them. At first, they wouldn't come near us. But now they're no longer stressed by our presence. We treat them very well. The alpaca's well-being is extremely important to us. In Valdivia, in southern Chile, at Austral University's Laboratory for Medical Biotechnology, Rojas and his team have patented 30 nanobodies that directly target SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Now they want to use the alpaca's nanobodies to develop a drug to treat COVID-19. This involves mixing the alpaca nanobodies with a fragment of a human antibody so that it is accepted by the human immune system. The drug could be inhaled or administered in the form of a nasal spray or injection and help to prevent severe or fatal cases of COVID-19. But the scientists need financial support to develop the drug and so far the Chilean government hasn't offered funding. It's not just about developing an antiviral therapy for SARS-CoV-2, but also showing that here, in a remote place like southern Chile, we are capable of developing a technology that can help bring a global pandemic under control. The scientists in Chile aren't the only ones researching alpaca nanobodies. There's a similar initiative underway at the University of San Francisco. And in Germany, the University of Bonn and the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen are engaged in nanobody research. But the scientists here in Chile are a step ahead. One of the big advantages of developing antibodies from camelids in Chile is that here the alpacas and llamas are in their natural habitat. At the university campus, the alpacas have their own enclosure covering more than three hectares of land, where they're free to roam, sleep and feed. The scientists haven't just given the alpacas names, they've also discovered distinct personality traits. Buddha is a bit shy. When new people are around, he won't eat out of my hand. He's not so keen on people he doesn't know. But others, like Don Io, for example, 
will eat out of anyone's hand. They all have different personalities. Despite his shyness, Buddha is quite the star on social media. He has nearly 17,000 followers on Instagram alone. The alpacas provide an alternative solution to monoclonal antibodies that is much cheaper. In the coming years, we'll probably see many products developed in the immune systems of these animals. With the necessary funding, the alpacas may be able to help us both in this pandemic and in future ones too. Alejandro Rojas and his team are convinced of that. That's all for this week. If you have a question for Derek Williams, write to us. And join us next time for a fresh edition of our COVID-19 special. Goodbye for now and take care.